Carrie, you want to do a sound check on the pulpit? Good morning. Sounds good to me. Ren, how does it sound? Okay. <laughs> she's the official uh, tester, so. Huh? So she's the official tester.
morning. Whether you're participating online or here in person, we say welcome home to Live Oak Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Mark Anderson, and I am so happy that you are here. For our guests, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. It's the go-to place to know everything that's going on around here, and there's a link on the homepage of our website. Thank you all for your continued care and following the current guidelines for in-person service so we can provide as safe an environment as possible during what remains a challenging time. We wear masks, we observe social distancing, we ask children to remain under parental supervision, we hum rather than sing our songs, we, and we use gestures of respect and connection instead of hugs to greet each other. Finally, we keep a sense of humor during it all. And now, here at home, here and at home, let us light our chalices. May the light we now kindle inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to bless and not to curse, to serve you, spirit of freedom. a boy each week Sunday we would go to church pay attention to the priest he would read the holy word consecrate the holy bread everyone would kneel and bow today the only difference is everything is holy now everything 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 is holy now. When I was in Sunday school, we would learn about the time that Moses split the sea in two and Jesus made the water wine. I remember feeling sad that miracles don't happen still. Oh, but now I can't keep track. Everything's a miracle Everything, everything Everything's a miracle Wine from water is not so small But an even better magic trick Is that anything is here at all So the challenging thing becomes not to look for miracles but finding where there isn't even one when holy water was a rare at best oh it barely met my fingertips but now I have to hold my breath like I'm swimming in a sea of it cause it used to be a world half there Heaven's second-rate hand-me-downs But I walk it with a reverent air Cause everything is holy now Everything, everything Everything is holy now Read a questioning child's face Say it's not a testament Oh, that'd be a very hard thing to say See another new morning come Tell me it's not a sacrament And I'll tell you that it can't be done This morning outside I stood And I saw a little red-winged bird it was shining like a burning bush Singing like a scripture verse Made me want to bow my head I remember when church let out And 
how things have changed since then Cause everything is holy now it Used to be a world out there Heaven's second rate hand-me-downs But I walk it with a reverent air Cause everything is holy now Everything, everything Everything, 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 everything is holy now. Day is a precious gift. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This church is a fellowship of people united by a common need of religious growth and companionship. We are not a company of saints perfect in faith and righteousness, but acknowledging our failures and shortcomings, we desire to be better than we are and seek to gather the fullness of principled living. We strive to journey together in love and peace, to seek the truth and to strengthen and uphold one another. We covenant to make love the doctrine of our life and make our life a continuing quest for the truth that it may be made manifest in our words and deeds. It is an ancient and sacred ritual to gather together with others to search for answers to be reminded of our worthy aspirations and to be in loving community. During times of war, instability, disease, want, still people gather to remember what is good and true and life-giving and to be in communion with one another. Let us celebrate the promises and possibilities of this day together. Amen. Every week when we gather, we share pieces of our life with each other. We share our sorrows so that we may offer comfort to one another, and we share our joys so that we may celebrate together. One of my joys today is the growing group of volunteers who have stepped forward to lead faith development this fall. In this religious community, we hold with reverence the knowledge that each week, a multitude of different emotions and experiences are brought together into this space. One of us may be celebrating, one weeping, one filled with determination, and one with despair. This mosaic of experiences is holy, and we honor all with our witness. Good morning, Samaya. You look like you have a problem. Would you like to talk about it? I'm, I'm, I'm sad because my teacher told me I need to try harder to stay in the lines when I color. But my crayons, they have a mind of their own. And sometimes I don't like where the lines are drawn. And, and, and she says it isn't real that when I make a purple cat and pink grass, it's not the way the world looks. <laughs> wow, Samaya, I bet that's really hard for you. Would you show me your picture, please? Mm 
Well, that is a purple cat, and I like it. I like the way you used colors to express your emotions and, and that you used the things that you really like to do. I think that's great. Can I tell you something about the world, Samaya? Something that I think is sad? Well, sometimes the world we live in tries to draw a circle around us or put us in a box based on what they think we should be, like a girl or a boy or an artist or a scientist. When we don't fit the shape of the container that they try to put us in, they could be angry or confused. And honestly, I think some grown-ups, they just want everybody to be like them. So they try to limit the choices that we can make. And maybe they don't see that squeezing us into that container hurts. But didn't it hurt them when they were little? Uh, it probably did. It probably did. But if they made themselves fit for long enough, maybe they forgot what it was like to see purple cats and pink skies or pink grass or blue tornadoes. Instead, they started to take on the shape of the container that they lived in. Hmm. Maybe they lost their imagination for what life could be like. That's kind of sad, isn't it? You know, all this talk reminds me, did you know that this month at Live Oak, we are talking about designing your own life? Design? You mean like scribbles and doodles? I love to scribble and doodle and design. Well, <laughs> it might be scribbles and doodles for you, and it might be something different for me or for one of your other friends. The point is, we all get to decide. We all have different life experiences. Do you remember the song we just sang in worship? Everything is holy now? Oh, yes, I really like that song, even though I don't understand what it all means. Well, Samaya, I think that it means that all of our lives are holy and that living into our best selves, that that's a sacred act. And we get to ask ourselves and other people here at Live Oak what that is for them. You know, for you, it might be scribbles and doodles that are holy. That's part of be what being here is about. So, Carrie, does that mean church is a place where I can color outside the lines? Oh, Samaya. Our church is a place where purple cats and pink grass and blue skies and scribbles and doodles all are holy and loved, and so are you. Each week, we engage in the spiritual practice of generosity, combining our resources to support the ministries of this church. Part of that mission is to empower dreams, and this Sunday, we will be sharing the offering with Camp Kesson to help empower their dreams to support children through and beyond their parents' cancer. If you wish, you may visit the donate button or on our website to donate, or place a check in the green offering box on the other side of the common grounds after the service. This morning, our offertory music contains words that may trigger an emotional response for some people. Carrie wanted me to share the following information regarding the meaning behind the lyrics. The information booklet in the Eurythmics 1983 album, Sweet Dreams, says this song is about life as it is, saying that here we are in our existences, trying to make sense of our lives and to survive. 
It refers to the types of people you run into in daily life and encourages you to move on despite obstacles. I loved to color as a child, just like Samaya. I loved to color with crayons and later colored pencils. What I especially liked was blending two colors together to create something new, something that didn't exist in my crayon box, and uh, be able to create a world that nobody else saw or maybe even understood. Remember back, remember back when you were a child, what were your favorite things to do? Um, besides coloring, I could fill up my day with mud pies and riding my bicycle and catching fireflies, playing games for fun, not to win. A feeling of freedom and wonder from exploring and learning and growing. And as a Unitarian Universalist, I consider that a lifelong pursuit. But when I was an adolescent, something inside me shifted when life became about fitting in, getting good grades, being recognized for my achievements, particularly because I grew up in a town where I felt like I was an outsider, that I already didn't fit in and I wasn't sure I wanted to. And at the same time, there were larger forces at play telling me that to thrive in that town I had to confine myself to the roles that they had defined for me. Now there are many wonderful teachers in the world and some of them are sitting right here today or online and schools and the education methods have changed so slowly over the years. Since I was young, since I raised my own children, and I know that still in some classrooms and still some parents focus on staying in the lines when you color, filling up all the white space on a page and producing a neat final product. Why is it that we, and by we I'm talking about the larger US culture, 
society, teach ourselves and our children to stay in the lines. That certain colors are right to use. That success relies on meeting expectations that are set by and for the dominant culture. Oh, I answered my question with a question. Success relies on meeting expectations set by the dominant culture. We assimilate to gain power and we hold on to power through assimilation. Maybe you've had a similar experience to mine as a child and, or maybe you never felt the freedom or wonder that I did. Perhaps you were privileged enough to always feel like you fit in or that you could easily morph in various social situations without giving up who you were. Perhaps you've always been comfortable doing your own thing and you've surrounded yourself with kindred spirits. I recognize that for me, a choice to not fit in was a relatively safe decision had I made it. And I also recognize that, that for those of us who carry a marginalized identity, Fitting in and taking on an assigned role can literally mean your own survival. What if we, the larger society, could redesign our lives to be more fully who we are, match our outer expression with our inner self? Break the, the confines of the roles that have been dictated to us based on our race, our size, our gender identity, our sexual orientation, and all the other isms that pervade our lives. As you heard, this month our theme is Design the Life You Want to Live. And today I want to look at some questions I considered in my own journey. Now maybe for some of you, you don't need to hear this message because you feel like you're already there, you're not struggling. But if you are struggling or unsure, I hope you find some wisdom in what I have to say today. Several years ago, faced with an empty nest, a relocation that I really didn't want, and a general unease with who those things were making me as a person, I set out on a journey to explore how I could live a more integrated life. I had been going along meeting expectations without examining my internal relationship to my decisions. And I got serious about redesigning my life and started asking myself some questions. Now, those of you that know me a little better probably already know I'm generally an ordered, neat, organized person in my job, in my home. For the most part, I've always been that way <laughs> when I was a child, when I had children at home. The house was clean, the dishes were done and put away, and my week was planned out ahead of time. And that served me really well. That habit served me really well in the workplace because that's what was expected of me. Now, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with those traits, with being an organized person. And there's nothing wrong with not being an organized person. But I realized that I hadn't developed those habits intentionally or with any thought for why. Why was this the way I am? And there's my first bit of advice for designing your life. Ask why. Why do I do the things I do? Why do I live the way I do? Why do I need to meet societal expectations, work certain hours, certain jobs, talk and dress a certain way? Your answer will most definitely be different from mine and from your neighbors. You might have a big fat, I don't. I don't feel the need to fit in. It might be I wish I didn't feel the need. It might be out of a sense of duty or obligation that you do the things that you do. And for some of us, sadly, it might be the choices you make keep you safer. The point is you get to examine the reasons. You might find in the process that there's something you need to unlearn or dig deeper into. And most definitely, I guarantee you will find white supremacy cultural norms have shaped your choices in this country. 
if living the way you do isn't bringing you joy or contentment, what might? So as I asked myself that question, it uncovered a pattern in my rigid planning that it was feeding my sense of failure and disappointment and self-doubt. I constantly work to unlearn that trait, that habit. And yes, I still plan and I can still disappoint myself, but I've also become more flexible and forgiving and open to different outcomes. My own spiritual practices have helped me ride those waves of self-doubt by giving me the space to examine my thinking and being. They've helped me move from get up and go and do to get up and go and be. So in the process of designing your life, I also recommend you ask yourself, who do I want to be? Not what do I want to do or be, but who? Who do I want to be in the world? Reverend Joanna frequently talks about this with us in her sermons. She talks about living our values in the world. And this is that question, who are you going to be? Being able to honestly answer can give you a touchstone to come back to when life goes sideways. An, an example, when my husband was in the hospital for over a month following a brain hemorrhage, I returned to this question over and over and I discovered that in order to survive, I had to be the kind of person who was vulnerable enough to ask for help and accept it. I had to open myself to new relationships that were outside my comfort zone with people who weren't like me. I couldn't do and be everything all the time, especially in a crisis situation. This opening of my heart was the best gift I could receive. I experienced the loving kindness of friends and strangers, and their compassion for me released my own strength so I could sit in the hospital every day and journey through months of speech, occupational, and physical therapy alongside my husband, all while ra raising a high schooler and working. On the outside, I had presented myself as a fiercely independent woman, but my soul had been longing for more interdependence. So the second part of that question, who do I want to be, is who do I want to be accountable to and in relationship with? And my sincere hope is that it's not only people who mirror my experience. I'll preface this next part by saying that US culture is not a monolith as much as it tries to portray itself as one. However, regardless of our race and individual culture, we do live in a white dominant societal system that asks us to wear metaphorical masks and hide ourselves from others. It's a culture that perpetuates conflict avoidance, which ultimately leads to more conflict because we haven't learned skills to engage our disagreements or allowed ourselves to listen to other people. And it teaches us that vulnerability is a weakness and independence is a strength. Instead of seeking out help, we soldier on thinking we need to manage by ourselves for ourselves and that there is something wrong with us if we can't. Ready to defend our right to do things our own way because that shows that we are strong, that we are strong, independent people. And ironically, I think it reinforces our need to find people who are like us because we haven't become comfortable being in relationships that challenge our own experience. We can be independent when everybody else around us is like us, but it's harder when they aren't. So I'm gonna encourage us to push back against these societal norms that are more suited, in my opinion, to creating robots than thinking and feeling human beings. I actually think that Unitarian Universalists are pretty good at this when it comes to our children. We do a good job of giving them the freedom to learn and explore. But as we reach adulthood, sometimes I think we're not so good at it. We slide into patterns that are maybe more robotic or autopilot than authentic. And even when we flaunt our uniqueness, 
and fight against a system that encourages conformity, we do still operate within that system, one that's cultivated to control, and it can be easy to lose ourselves. We might view others with little empathy or compassion or understanding for the choices they make that are different from ours. But our seventh principle calls us to recognize the interdependence of all beings, not just those we agree with or that fit in defined boxes, but all beings. In her dissertation, Interdependence as a Lifeway, the colonization and resistance in transnational Native American and Tibetan communities, it's a long title, <laughs> Natalie Avalos Cisneros talks about religious communities as resistance in indigenous culture. And she says, I ask, how does interdependence as a lived tradition resist colonization as both a structure and ideology? I argue that cultural regeneration, centrally in the form of religious practice, is a driving factor in resistance, if not sometimes the very practice of resistance. Religious praxis heals and strengthens these communities, but is also understood to create the material conditions for liberation. The dynamic intersection of religion and politics in these movements provides a new perspective on social justice and humanitarianism, illustrating that the just and humane treatment of others is necessitated in a world in which others are an extension of one's self. When I read that abstract from the dissertation, I thought, yes, yes, others are an extension of one's self. It's our seventh principle right there. What if we modeled interdependence and we taught others to do the same? Part of designing the life I want to live includes being in a religious community where spiritual learning, growth, and religious praxis are expected and embraced. A communal space where we risk being vulnerable and interdependent. A community where we listen deeply rather than expect or ask that others' experiences and ideas conform to ours. A place to practice healthy conflict resolution and restorative justice, where we inspire people to live out our principles in their daily life. What if as Unitarian Universalists, we help each other get free from the containers that our society has tried to place us in? What if we help decolonize US culture by decolonizing our congregations and our denomination first? What if we allow the space for people to discover who they are in relationship to others? It's not an easy task, and honestly, sometimes I don't think we're so good at it in our own UU spaces, but we try. And where better to practice these skills than in a covenanted community, a place where we can birth our souls and bear witness to others on their journey. It will take courage on all our parts to look deeply at the personal container we inhabit and open ourselves to change. It would require the willingness to be counterculture to society, not just for those who are outside of the circle that we want to invite in, but for those who are already within our circle, but are still longing for a place where they can express their full self and design the life they want to live in relationship to others. It's a space where people are free to ask, why do I do the things I do? Who do I want to be? And who am I accountable to in my life? That's liberating work, people. And in today's world, I call that coloring outside the lines. I invite you into a moment of meditation and reflection on these words, from breaking and blessing 
by Sean Parker Denison. I wish you a single story, not a simple fairy tale with only happiness, but one life without secrets or omissions, without the need for fake faces, one pointed outward, the other inward and real. I wish for you the twin beauties of clarity and consistency, knowing the singular word that holds all of you together, all of you at once, all of you. I wish you no need to hide, no reason to live in shadows or half-truths, no need to cover the spark and sparkle of your heart to keep it from catching the light of sun or moon. I wish you wholeheartedness that arises from the liberty before needing to be freed, the completeness that precedes breaking, the integrity of your being, a unity undivided and boundless. I wish you a far-reaching welcome from within, full and absolute acceptance, nothing withheld from yourself, unrealized or unfinished. And I wish you a place and a people who do not want you in pieces, incomplete and partial. A world that no longer asks anyone to wrench apart their heart or divide soul from mind, from nature, from core. I bless you with all that is whole. I want to encourage adults to consider signing up for a chalice circle. Chalice circles are small groups focused on meaningful connection. A group of eight to ten people commit to meet regularly throughout the year for deep listening, reflection, and dialogues on topics that enrich their own faith development. The link to the sign up is on our website. And I also invite you to stay for a little while and join in today's All Ages Faith Development Program. Part of our individual spiritual journey is learning to let go. And today we will focus on letting go of anger or hurt that we are carrying through an actual physical ritual. If you're interested in participating, please gather in this area around 1025. We'll start at 1030. And now as we go through life, creating our own design, may we have the courage to break out of artificial containers. And may we also have the support of a loving community where we are accepted for our whole selves. May it be so. We extinguish this flame, but we recommit anew to carrying into our week the flame of justice and love. May we share with others the courage and strength which we find here. <laughs> 